Hi, everyone. I'm Shreya. My pronouns are she, her. I was born in India, raised in the Middle East, and I've spent my young adult years as a new immigrant in the land that is currently known as Canada. I'm a mental health advocate, and I work at JAX.org, the youth mental health charity based in Canada. Um, and I have personally struggled with my mental health immensely, um, especially because of how appearance ideals impacted me as a young person. And that's what we're here to talk about today is everybody's individual experiences with appearance ideals and how that has affected disordered eating and their mental health in general. Our goal today is really just to make room for a more nuanced conversation that highlights people who have not been brought to the table before um, or enough. Given how complex all of this is, it's very unlikely that we'll be able to cover everything today. All the people who are with me um, here at this round table are exceptional individuals who will just speak their truths and that in itself will be a revolution. I'll give everybody a chance now to introduce themselves, state their pronouns and let us know a bit more about what brings them to this conversation. My name is Abby Lee Hallett, pronouns she, her, or they, them. I'm a network representative with jack.org. I'm hoping to bring a little bit of a conversation to appearance ideals. And you don't always see people of influence talking about those sorts of messages that are out there that uh, are harmful to a lot of groups and that perpetuate certain ideals that only a very small percentage of the population fall into, if anyone. So uh, that's why I'm here. And I'm just so uh, looking forward to creating this safe shared space with everyone today. Hi, my name is Gabe Thibault. My pronouns are they and them. Today, I'll be talking about from the point of view of a non-binary person who lives with chronic illness and disability and who is a wheelchair user, a chronic illness and disability advocate, a neuroscientist, a podcaster, and an artist. Today, I really want to focus on the non-binary trans experience and the lack of, of non-binary representation in eating disorder research, especially the transgender space that is already extremely limited. I am Seema Hari. My pronouns are she, her, or they, them. I am a non-binary person of color for, of Indian descent. I came to this conversation as a dark-skinned non-binary person who comes from India as a representative of the lower caste or Bahujans, as we call them. I currently reside in, uh, in the United States of America on Tongwa land, and I hope to bring the perspective of someone who is dark skinned that is uh, from a lower caste in India and how that affected my appearance ideals and as someone who has been suicidal for the first 20 years of her life just because of appearance ideals. Hey everyone, my name is Mina. My pronouns are he, him. I am a content creator and uh, a plus size model based in Toronto. I'm really passionate about um, empowering other queer people and uh, specifically queer men to be confident in, in our bodies and to kind of take away the, sh the shame um, that a lot of men associate with struggling with their body image and eating disorders. And professionally, what I'm really passionate about is creating uh, representation for any kind of body diversity in men's fashion. That was something that really impacted me growing up and we still don't see any kind of progress when it comes to that. So I, um, I'm really passionate about changing that narrative and making it a lot more inclusive. My name is Melissa Hauser and my pronouns are she and her. I am actually originally from the United States, but I'm now living in the Toronto, Canada area. I am professionally a psychologist working with people of all ages, genders and sexualities with eating disorders and other diverse experiences. Hi, I'm Rafaela Mancuso. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm in Alberta. I like to talk to people about mental illness and body image and fat phobia because I deal with all of that myself. And I just really want to take my own struggles and turn them into something beautiful. So hopefully I can reach 
other people so that they don't have to struggle like I've struggled. And I just think we are also ashamed or we're told to be ashamed of these different parts of ourselves. And I think beautiful conversations like this just really help to reduce that. So thanks for having me here. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Baker, uh, pronounced he, him. I reside what currently known as Toronto. Um, I have, I guess, I don't know if I bring certain perspective, but more of my own journey with mental health from gender perspective as well as a man um, and my own struggle with uh, eating disorder in the past and still exists up to this point. I hear it a lot from my friends, but there's not it's not been talked about and I think it might be value to share that. Um, I'm really looking forward to share that space with everybody here. Uh, thank you for having me. Welcome. I will just dive right into conversation about it because I think the way we want to do this is just make it very fluid and open. I'd love to know what struggling with your body image means to you, to anybody in this call, or what struggling with an eating disorder means to you. And I'll start with like a small anecdote about myself. I have always been a larger person and that had very deep impacts on my self-esteem as a child because in my particular family, thinness was valued a lot. And the fact that my body was large was seen as like a parental failure. And in Indian society, that's uh, that's sort of what you're concerned about is like how you're viewed in society as a family unit. And um, so that was difficult. Like my first um, lived memory is of me being worried about my size, which is sad to think about that like a two-year-old child can, can struggle with that. I strongly think that like, messages of fat phobia are so, so harmful and so pervasive and children pick up on it very, very easily. It's been a struggle to try and unlearn that. Um, frankly, I think like an example of how I still struggle with that is that I really enjoy working from home in the pandemic because no one needs to see my body. And it's been so liberating. Like it's just shoulders up. I have that catfish type of face. You can't tell what my body size is from my face. And it's a privilege. Um, and, and I feel relief because of it. So that's just, you know, it's like a lifelong struggle that's had like a deep impact on, on my on my mental health journey. And I have struggled very severely with my mental health. And it's got everything to do with um, not meeting appearance ideals and all the, you know, geographical locations I've lived in. Um, yeah, so I'd love to know what struggling with body image means to you or to the community you're representing or anything you want to speak to. That really resonated with me, what you said, Shreya, because my memories of not feeling okay with myself are literally my earliest childhood memories. And uh, as a dark-skinned child, I say that, you know, the experience of being invalidated begins the moment you're born, because in India, people call your parents and ask them, like, is, this, is the child dark-skinned or light-skinned? And my dad uh, is darker-skinned than my mom, and my mom is light-skinned. So this experience of being a female or a femme girl child uh, being dark skinned is even worse than a boy child being dark skinned. So my brother was never really harassed about his skin color as much as I was, even though he was elder to me and had, you know, we had similar appearances, but I was always the one who was the target. To me, the biggest hurdle was the invalidation of my personhood because of my dark skin. So it was always like, oh, she's less than, and like, she doesn't matter. And every single memory I have of my childhood is of being denied something or being ridiculed or being harassed. And to those effects of that time still exist now. And I didn't even know back then that I was a depressed child. I didn't have access to those words. I didn't have access to mental health counselors. All I had was my school teachers and my counselors and my parents. And I realize now that I have access to therapy that I was depressed and suicidal from the from the get-go, from the moment, you know, I have the capacity to be, have memories and have thoughts. And it was all because, um, you know, my skin is, um, is really dark skin, uh, obviously in India, but I also lived in Bombay, which is kind of like a multicultural, um, you know, society in India because it's a big city. So I wasn't surrounded by people like me. So people from South India tend to be darker. I was surrounded by Gujaratis and Marathis who, you know, came from various parts of uh, India and uh, they all were had you know different skin tones than me so I was the darkest girl in my in my class 
And that meant that I was bullied every second of my life. So I was really afraid to open my mouth, really afraid to go to the bathroom. So in the recess break, I wouldn't go to the bathroom because I would get bullied uh, to no end. So I would uh, spend the entire school day without going to the bathroom because I A, didn't want to get bullied and B, didn't want to look in the mirror. So that is when uh, my you know image issues really started. And uh, it wasn't restricted to just beauty, which was the problem for me. It was about like, every single skill I had was invalidated. I, as a child, I loved to dance, I loved to sing, but I was never given the opportunity because I was dark skinned. Like I'm 33 now. I spent 28, 29 years of my life thinking that I couldn't be a creative person just because I didn't see anybody like me. Whew, need to take a breath. So for me, it's the, it's the way that image issues take away your dreams and take away your hope. And I spent 20 years of my life not wanting to live. And I felt like, sorry. <laughs> Take your time. Yeah. The way I was treated was also uh, related to caste. So in India, we have casteism where, you know, there was this um, you know, particular caste that was decided for you 4,000, 3,000 years ago, they created a stratified system of people uh, who belong to specific castes and you couldn't escape your caste because it was based on lineage. So if your ancestors 4,000 years ago were doing a certain job, you, regardless of what your ancestors after that did, regardless of what you do now, you're stuck to what the classification was back then. So my uh, people were fishermen and people who clean fish and fishermen, you know, laborers who worked on other people's boats as well, divers, people who, you know, uh, went diving in the ocean for shells and shellfish and pearls and all that kind of stuff. I was from a lower caste, but what it means to be a person in India is that your appearance decides how you are perceived, obviously, but your appearance is also used to kind of assume what your caste is. So looking at me, people would assume that my caste is, you know, I'm from a lower caste or I'm an untouchable and that is true that I come from that caste, which was considered untouchable once upon a time. But the way that was used to dehumanize me in every conversation was what made me, uh, what pushed me to the brink of suicide, right? I would walk down the street and people would assume that I'm a beggar, assume that I'm an untouchable, spit on me, spit on my face, call me all kinds of names. And that is really what took away my hope because I felt like not only am I not beautiful, like nobody wants to look at me. And also they want to like, they, uh, the message that was repeated to me in all these like skin lightning commercials, et cetera, was that you are unwanted. You're not going to get success because you're dark skinned. You're not going to find love because you're dark skinned. You're not going to find you basically your exist. Your parents are going to be upset because of your existence, because you're dark skinned. And this was what the society was reflecting to me. So I felt like I had no place in the world. And I felt like, you know, my face was bad luck. And I have, you know, gone through a whole process of, you know, resurrecting from that and picking myself up from that position. So I feel like there is hope. And I feel like this conversation is going to help a lot of people see themselves. And that's what I lacked. I didn't have anybody who was going through the same things as me. So I had no uh, support system whatsoever. So I hope that this you know, conversation helps people realize that they're not alone. Thank you so much for sharing that, Seema. That's um, brutal. Um, it's so brutal. And this perspective that you're bringing is so important because in mainstream mental health spaces, whenever South Asian people are represented, it's always upper caste people, like always, like myself. There's never the nuance of like what, how our societies are stratified and what that experience is for people who are deemed lower than others for no right reason. And it's also an important message because it's important for South Asian people in the diaspora who hear this to understand how, how current casteism is and how current colorism is. I don't think many people debate colorism as much as they do casteism. So I'm so grateful to you that you put yourself in a vulnerable space to talk about that. It's heartbreaking that the the intersections of your identity made it so you didn't want to be alive and it had everything to do with with how you look. So I'm I'm really really grateful for your vulnerability and so so um such an important thing to to say to people. And I have upper caste privilege. I, I have class privilege. I have every type of privilege you can name uh in, in my social location as being an Indian person. The only thing truly that I didn't have was 
fitting the appearance ideal of thinness. I'm like rethinking about the ways in which we look at personhood and the different ways in which we can invalidate personhood. And I think a lot of this is about that. It's about the ways in which we've been invalidated and which we've tried to regain that power through control. The less and less control you have, the more and more you try to control it. Especially when we don't have words for what we're trying to control, it can make it even harder. I was not a large child by the standards of the Western world. But in my family, I grew up with model thin siblings because genetics, like it's genes, people. There's not much I can do about that one. Um, But I was also very aware that I looked very different. And those differences of body dysmorphia or looking at my body in the mirror and seeing something very different than what actually was apparent. For me, that most came back in looking at pictures of myself from when I was like 16 and like thinking about the way in which I used to view those images versus the way that I view them now, that you looked a certain way, then you look back at the image and it is nothing like what you had, like, you thought and you're like, what the fuck was I obsessed about? What was I upset about? And with me, it went to um, being told by my younger sibling one day, this is my earliest, one of my earliest memories on vacation. She comes up to me, little shit looks me straight in the eye and goes, you're fat. I go, I'm crying. And I go to my dad, I want comfort. And I'm like, dad, am I fat? Looks at me and goes, well, you could lose some weight. Like, sir, come on, come on. Like and now I understand as an adult, that was not the right way to respond. So I have hope for the future because I will not raise my children like this. But that still went from my family having a developing a natural way of talking about things that were centered around thinness and thinness being the norm and anything from a cis white heteronormative lens is abnormal. I've noticed so much more as I had a recent increase in my weight due to a medication that I had to take and I use a manual wheelchair that is um tight, 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 tight as they are supposed to be. If not, you can't really get around with them. And all of a sudden I couldn't fit into my wheelchair. And like, that was a physical problem for me at that time. That was a physical limitation to me because it actually did not help my mobility. And with my disease, it is not a good idea. And I was actually able for the first time, I think in my adult life, recognizing that as a person with gender dysphoria, what was affecting me was not the body dysmorphia. It was the gender dysphoria. And it was the way that the weight was sitting on my body. It was the way in which I could just couldn't fit into my mobility aid, which was frustrating me. And that to me, I think has been one of the biggest arches for me is getting to this point of being able to be like, it is okay to be unhappy with your body. It just depends on why and what you're doing around that and the way that you are addressing this and seeing dysphoria in a caring light, I think, and seeing your eating disorder in a caring light and an act of self survival, you know, an act of survival and self care, even though we often don't treat eating disorders like an act of self-care because they do harm us. But in the end, our brain will always want to be on survival mode. It will always try to help us. And so sometimes the question for me was to ask, what was I trying to do? And in the end is I was trying to have a body that was going to make me safe in a space that wasn't safe for me. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's it's truly a tragedy how little resolution there is on all of the other genders apart from male and female. 
when it comes to anything truly. But then in the in the eating disorder or body dissatisfaction space, everything we know, all the research that exists is so heavily skewed towards women in general. There isn't an understanding of how this affects men. There isn't an understanding of how it affects non-binary people, trans people, anybody who doesn't fit within that male-female dichotomy. It's it's a tragedy because you spend so much time not being able to name what you're suffering with. And that is heartbreaking. So I'm I'm so happy that you brought that perspective to the table. I want to say that I love, uh, Gabe, what you said about regaining power. For me, I was put on a diet when I was as young as eight years old. And I think that was kind of my earliest memories of that, specifically when I came out as uh, as gay in, in the Middle East where I grew up, it's still largely illegal to be gay there. So, uh, you know, I remember like Googling um, gay men just to kind of see what was going on. And that Google search, it was just mostly like white, uh, thin men. Um, and uh, that made me realize from a young age that like, I kind of have to look like that if I were to be part of this community. And what is really sad is that unfortunately that is somehow still kind of the the predominant narrative within the gay community of, uh, you know, what we, what we look at as attractive. So it's crazy that within the last, you know, 15 years that that has been a constant thing. Talking about body image is about kind of regaining power and to take away power from, first of all, feel empowered to kind of talk about it and hopefully create change, but also regaining power from these like ideals that are still unfortunately um, so prevalent now. Finding just any type of 2S LGBTQIA plus representation is like thin, it's white. I am struggling to find like porn that looks like me. Like, let's all be honest. Who has found porn that looks like them? I see your faces, the answer is no. The answer is no, okay? And that makes it hard to see yourself as a sexual being. Points to wheels again. Like I literally had to yell at a doctor once and tell him how I had sex. Why is it all of these barriers to entry? Why is it this white, cis, abled, normative, neurotypical lens that we're seeing all this shit through. Like, why is it this colonized lens we're seeing all this shit through and living all this shit through, being forced to live this shit through? Like, you looked, you went from one place on the planet and went like, what do gay men look like? And they showed you a white dude. Pro- I'm promising you that if we took a statistics, the majority of white dudes don't look like that. The majority of gay dudes don't look like that. So like, why are we putting this up? And like, why is it still there? Like, I know it's the conversation of media and who controls it, but it's still like, that still affects like the next generation because even algorithm like TikTok are promoting that same shit. It like, it's not stopping. We're still having the same algorithms push the same shit over and over, even as we put in more diversity. And as we like put ourselves out there, we're either like shadow banned or banned entirely. So how do we make that representation happen? Representation is just so key. If you don't see yourself in certain spaces, it kind of lends you the message that you're not welcome there. For example, if I'm thinking of my own experience, I grew up in a pretty small suburban town where there weren't really any 2S LGBTQ plus folks there. That acronym didn't exist at that point in school. Like even just having L and G, that was like, whoa, revolutionary. So when I was going through school and like that was not even something that or a community that I thought I was even a part of for I think a lot of young women, female identifying folks. It's like all right, you're gonna do your thing, go through school, and then good life looks like marrying someone of the opposite sex, marrying a man, having a family. And that's kind of what what I thought at the time. And I can't even 100% explain this because my my own family, it's not like they pushed that narrative on me. So it's very privileged and very lucky in that sense. But I think just what you see around you when it's all one way, you just expect your own life is going to go that way. And listening to what you were saying, Gabe, I thought it was kind of really like, first off, yeah, thank you everyone for sharing because there's stories I think are so vulnerable and so real and you're so just resilient for having 
gone through and now speaking to others in a way that hopefully they're going to gain something from this. So first off, I want to say thank you. Gay, what you were saying about how looking back at pictures, like, wow, like I can't, like, how did I see myself in, in that particular light? Like I was sitting here, I'm like, I feel like I've almost had sort of the opposite experience. So for me going through my younger years up until I think I was probably about 21. So I would have like graduated undergrad at this point. But again, at that point, I kind of fit the mold of what feminine beauty ideals are. And I think I knew that and sort of played to that. And I just assumed that when, for example, I was getting dressed up to go somewhere, I just thought, oh, well, this must just be an uncomfortable experience for everyone. Like dressing up must just be uncomfortable because often I was wearing at those sorts of things for like, like a dress, like a, like I didn't really have language for that at the time. I just assumed that, all right, if you're getting dressed up to go somewhere, you might not feel the best about yourself. You might feel awkward about it. That's not really something I said to anyone at the time. Looking back, I'm like, I probably was just uncomfortable with what I was wearing. Maybe I would have wanted to wear something that was like a pantsuit or like one of those cool like long cape things. There's just like really cool outfits that are like pants and they have a cape on it. And it's like really cool. Anyways, um, something a little bit more like what we would describe as androgynous looking, I suppose. But at the time I get heaps of like you look really good in that so I'm like well I'm not gonna be a fool and just wear something else because I'm getting all of this praise from people so clearly this is good and seeing some nods so yeah I, I think that's definitely not an isolated experience so anyway kind of went went through this and like continue to wear the same sort of dresses continue to feel uncomfortable until I got to graduation I was like hmm like something's off like I think I might be queer and sure enough that was the case I think if, however your journey is that is beautiful and it is valid for me I laugh at myself because it was the whole queer stereotype of like I'm queer cuts off all my hair immediately <laughs> starts experimenting with style all that sort of stuff so I again my hair is very long and I cut it to about um, where it is now which is very very short what you said about you know attractiveness uh really affected me too because since the beginning of my life everyone had told me that i was unattractive unwanted i even though from the beginning i knew that i didn't feel any gender from the beginning like i always knew that i was like this being that didn't feel any gender or any of that sort but because i was called unattractive so much and the gendered expectation of being a girl was to be attractive I kind of rejected that by, you know, dressing up as a boy and like, you know, performing, you know, boyhood. And it was even worse because boys would reject me too and treat me even worse. Girls in school would also reject me because they were, they thought I was like a boy. So it was this really confusing space and we didn't have any words for it. And like, no one knew how to express it. Like you either had to be a girl or a boy, or, you know, they called me a tomboy back then because I was expressing myself like a boy. But even tomboys were like just a phase or something that you just like, you know, did as a choice or something like that. So it was never accepted. And it was all, it's all started because for me, it was like, I was being forced into doing something because I was not accepted as who I was. And that led to even more bullying and even more, you know, uh, non-conformity and confusion in my head because I was like, why am I not allowed to just be who I am? Like, I don't feel any gender. And, you know, if I'm not accepted as a girl, not accepted as a boy, like, where do I even stand, you know? So it's so important and so relieving right now that we have these words because back then I had no other word except for saying I'm a tomboy and going with that, even though I didn't know that was fully true either. That's such an interesting point. Experiencing what what your gender is is like it's a really complicated thing for for everybody. But how your um, how the appearance ideals play into that, into validating what your gender is, is is alarming. Growing up, I felt very excluded from femininity in general because I could never be feminine in in the outward ways because of my size. I I was also 
sort of viewed as an adult because I was a larger kid. It was very common in India as well, where if I would go into a store um, immediately, like even when I was below the age of 10, I'd be taken to the women's section and, you know, people would always make comment on like how I look like I'm at least 18 years old when I was like nine. It was definitely in part because I felt like I couldn't occupy female spaces. It just wasn't an option for me as somebody with a larger body. And um, I, I really appreciate how everybody is like put so much um, emotional strength into exploring the subject of how imposing appearance ideals really run the risk of invalidating you as a person at your core. A lot of what you've all shared has really stuck with me and throughout this conversation I've just felt this heaviness on me it's like my struggles is still it's not even in the past which makes it hard which I know I think so many things are like past and present for all of us but like fat phobia is still seen in society on social media as such a bad thing as an illness as a thing to fear as a thing to reject no matter how or why and I really resonated with what you said Shreya about well a lot because I was also like a bigger child and I'm living in a bigger body now as well and I've been learning to kind of destigmatize fatness and the word fat like I it's even hard for me to say like, yep, I'm a fat woman because that was such a harmful term my whole life. And my body size definitely affects my life experience so much, but I don't want it to be my main identifier, but sometimes it's not my choice. I never felt like I got to choose how people saw me or see like who I really am because you just saw fatness you just saw this chubby kid and I felt that it was my job it was my obligation to shrink myself to be thinner to lose weight so that I can finally make my family happy people will finally accept me I can get the boyfriend I always wanted because oh my gosh of course I don't have a boyfriend when I'm fat like who would want that it was always just about waiting like my life can't begin yet because I'm waiting until I get to be okay. I'm waiting until I finally am good enough to change my body so that I can be accepted. And then maybe, yeah, I can go do all the things I want to do. Right. But until that point, I am defective until that point, nothing else matters like even a haircut, even if I got a haircut, I told myself like, it doesn't matter because I'm still fat. It doesn't matter if I paint my fingernails. It doesn't matter if I get new clothes because at the end of the day, I am still fat. And that is the only thing that people can see of me. And that's my biggest barrier to life. And I just recently was diagnosed a few months ago with an eating disorder, which I didn't even know about. I thought it was my job as a fat person to restrict. I thought that my goal was to eat. I'm sorry, I don't want to trigger anyone um, talking about eating stuff, but I thought it was my job to eat as little as possible because then I could at least prove to people that I'm trying, right? Even if I'm still in a bigger body, it's, oh, but I don't really eat. Even now I hide behind that eating disorder of atypical anorexia because on my Instagram, I'll get fat phobic comments um, or I'll talk about fat phobia and diet culture and people living in smaller bodies will say, oh, you can't say that because I have anorexia. And I'm like, yeah, me too. Like, same, <laughs> this isn't about that. This isn't about shaming people living in smaller bodies at all. This is about stepping back and realizing how we treat other people and how we treat ourselves. Like I'm still trying to convince myself like on the daily, like, okay, maybe it's okay if I don't like shrink myself. Yeah, I look, I look, I think I can accept myself in this photo. Maybe if I, like, can I envision the rest of my life 
still looking like this because my whole life that was never the future it was always like what can I be once I finally do what I'm supposed to do and for me working towards eating disorder recovery meant eating more it meant eating more quantity it was eating more frequently and that was really, really hard that the one thing I was told my whole life not to do is that thing that's moving me closer to a place of health. And oh, it's hard when it's not just inside, right? Like we have the internal and external battles when it's both. And I'm trying to tell myself, you know what? It's okay, we can do this. Maybe getting some body neutrality. But when the world keeps telling me that my existence is flawed, that anything I say is invalid because of this one physical feature, how can I remain at this neutral point? Like it's, it just honestly feels unattainable for me. And uh, I don't wanna pretend like I have all the answers cause I really don't. And as I said, it's a, a daily battle, but I'm learning that I, am and can be more than just my body no matter what it looks like or what other people think of me because of that and I really hope that we can continue these conversations so that other people don't have to wait 24 years to get to that point too. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing that perspective to the table. I am. Um, fat phobia is just not given the, the credit it deserves. People are so openly fat phobic. It is, it is just accepted as fat fact that fat is harmful. So it's logical to shame a fat person because they're just making bad decisions. And nobody who who could appear underweight is ever shamed in the way fat people are. Something that just broke my heart uh, with what you said and and really I related to. And also in what Seema said. It's just because of the imposing appearance ideal, feeling like your life is on hold. I don't have the barrier that Seema has because Seema can't change these things about herself. But I have that expectation from society and, and Rafaela, so do you. And so does anybody who has ever occupied a larger body that you need to be striving to change this. So there, there's no option but to look at the way you currently exist as like mandatorily temporary. Otherwise, you like you said you can't envision existing in any way and uh you are allowed to struggle with this currently i struggle with this currently this is not a thing of my past i'm not here as like some i figured it out and now i'm like the scholar on eating disorders hell no yeah what you said just like really really meant the world to me i'm so so happy that you you brought up fat phobia and it's just such a it's such a travesty that the things that fat people have to say is undermined so much. There's a there's this amazing book called Fearing the Black Body by Dr. Sabrina Strings. And she talks a lot about uh, fat phobia and its roots in anti-black racism. And it's alarming to say the least that to maintain the fallacy of a superior race, um, fatness is associated with blackness. And then the imperative of anybody in society is to, to actively move away from that as much as possible. And then that history is lost in time and it's fat, like fat phobia is decontextualized, but it comes from there in this cultural context and hurts absolutely everybody. And yeah, there's just so, so many, so many levels to this. At least through my lens of being a chronically ill person, that the way that Rafaela spoke about her experience of fat phobia is a lot about how it's the medicalization of fatness. It is the treatment of fatness as an illness, which it is not, and we know it is not. But in that, you see in which the way that illness is treated and that in the way to how the medical industrial complex works and that it is there to fix you. It is not there to help you. It is there to cure you. It is there to ask what is wrong. It is there to ask what is not wrong and not what is can make your quality of life better. Like that, like they, I did a flicking thing out of my screen. It is about fixing the thing which 
then gives others the ability to give us unsolicited advice, to comment, to ask why your feet can move in your chair or why as a gay man, you don't look like everybody else or why as a trans person, you are not androgynous or that you owe androgyny and not allowing the true other people's truth that androgyny and a non-binary identity don't have to equate. It's, I very much hear the um, treatment of fatness as a, as an illness. And then that creeping of health culture, the medical industrial complex coming up and going, how do we fix you? Not how do we make your day to day better? How do we make tomorrow easier? The amount of time I spend thinking about how people will react to my body, to my body as a non-binary person who is not perfectly real thin or has a completely flat chest or has um, had, I have not had top surgery. And for me, that is the biggest barrier between my eating disorders and my triggers for that and feeling better. Melissa, I I would love for you to be able to speak to your personal, professional experience, whatever you want to bring to the table. There is quite a lot of bias in medical spaces that excludes people from receiving adequate care. An unfortunate stat is that if uh, a person with a larger body goes to the doctor, their complaints are less likely to be viewed as valid Um, And everything is more likely to be just, you know, deemed as an artifact of obesity complications. And they're less likely to be understood as struggling with an eating disorder. If they are, they don't have to be. Overall, just not, uh, not very likely to receive respect or sympathy or humanity in some cases. So um, I would love to know from your, from your professional experiences, like what does uh, the world of eating disorders look like to you? I've seen like pieces of a lot of your different stories that resonate with certain things that I've seen in my clients as well. And I'm just like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm like seeing these things and like, I can really resonate like with what Rafaela was saying in terms of not understanding that like what she was experiencing was was an eating disorder because of like always like hearing like everything about fat phobia and always being made to feel like she should be eating less like than than she was i really hate like the diagnosis of atypical anorexia because it like sets people up to feel like their experience of anorexia is different and like somehow like less valid than someone who is thin and chronically underweight because they have the same exact like set of symptoms and the medical professionals like just struggle to see it because for another instance there is very little training on eating disorders in medical school to begin with virtually none it's like a very specialty area and so diagnosis is often missed to begin with so then it's taking someone who's outside like the normative cultural uh, expectation about weight and shape and then like trying to figure out like what's going on is really really hard i I think one of the most important messages about like this decolonized space is that like people of all genders and people of all sexual identities and people of all sizes are people who are struggling with eating disorders One of the things that I think is hopeful is that in my practice, I have seen people of different cultural identities, like a a large portion of of male clients, a lot of like non-binary or or trans clients. I do think at least there is like some shifting recognition in terms of like being able to see that it's not just like cisgender, like white um, 16 year old, like girl phenomena at this point. So I think that like piece is getting a little bit better. However, we have a long way to go in terms of medical professionals being able to like accurately recognize like, and like also not be like blaming towards people in terms of their experiences. 
there is a, a lot of damage done also by medical professionals um, in terms of like blaming like some of the clients for and some individuals for what they're going through, putting the onus on like the, that fat phobia still. And we have a long ways to go in terms of that, um, I think as well. So uh, on the one hand, I'm, I'm hopeful. I do feel like we need to continue to like empower and like um, provide information and knowledge to medical professionals. Eating disorders need to be covered in medical school. And like the, the positive is that there's opportunities for treatment for a wide range of like humans who deserve it. I don't always feel hopeful when I think about progress in this space, just because of all the barriers that exist, but um, I'm happy you're hopeful. It makes me feel hopeful. And uh, I'm, I really appreciate your professional perspective on the issue. It's very validating to have somebody who's in the space say that, yes, these are problems. So thank you so much for that. I have to be hopeful. Otherwise it's hard to do this work. And um, honestly, the people that I work with every day are so inspiring. So like, it's really like a, a pleasure to get to work with them and to like hear all of your voices. I think what resonated to me the most is that uh, how, if you don't fit in a box, like how your identity is tied to your self-image as well, uh, or the other way around, it's almost like a cycle in some way. My experience growing up in the Middle East, like my family, like, especially as a man, it's like almost, there's a sense of responsibility even bigger on you. Like, oh, it's your mistake for um, for not, like, uh, I was a bigger guy. And it's your mistake for not, like, taking care of yourself. It's always you. And I was boxed in a way that, oh, you're just fat because your grandpa or your dad, that's that's what you're supposed to, that's how we're seeing you. And this is how we define I remember uh, there wasn't anything about uh, how to care of yourself. It's always about, like, from a place of, uh, control and like heat to yourself that's how you're motivating yourself to like kind of how you treat yourself in some way so I think I took me years and years uh, and I still like to this point I'm always finding myself falling into my own habit of like eating my own emotion um, at times and like as a way of like dealing with the stress uh, being like grown up from an anxious family as well was just um, there was no space for you to think about being able to like validate some of your own experiences or like be the person who you are. It's always like you're boxed in something. And what ended up happening, I think the funny thing is for me is when I, I thought when I was younger, I thought immigrating to Canada is uh, get to be me, right? And I get to be um, this, you know, this in the space where everybody could be themselves. And to my surprise, um, like from from months one, I, as soon as I came to Canada, the people I met, they automatically start enforcing their own picture or image that the society has been enforcing on them, on me. Why aren't you acting this way? Why aren't you talk your uh, emotion right away? This man shouldn't be doing this, right? Or I did not know what, like it's just almost like I moved from a place and another place and it's, it's the same way to be treated in that. I didn't know what therapy is or mental health is until I'm in my late 20s, right? That's like a new concept altogether for me. How do I know how to love myself? That's something that I was never taught. So if you don't have that base, like it's just, it's almost like a vicious cycle of, you just start hitting yourself and you just bundled up to something else and you're, that affects the way you see yourself, that affects the way, uh, you know, for prof professionally, for your jobs, or like well, how people see you, because if you don't, if you don't know how to value yourself, like that's you no know, people basically will just go off their energy in some way. I think it's helpful to know, like this is, um, like you people are not alone. You're not alone. Like there's there's that there's that uh, scenario, and like how how we always like battle some of our own internal. Um, you know, like uh, thinking on how, how do we want to be or how to present ourselves and like outside what society wants to see out of us. My own family's background, like part like white settler Canadian and part Middle Eastern with Lebanese background. So I can, I can speak to Lebanese culture. I don't know how much this extends to other uh, Middle Eastern cultures, but I know like I'm just thinking back to some of the Lebanese weddings that I've been to and in the culture generally it's 
like I think this is true of the Canadian culture as well, but I think in the Lebanese culture, it's kind of dialed up a few notches where to display success is to display like a certain type of body, clothing, um, and aesthetic. Thank you, Abby Lee. Thank you, Baker, for talking about the the experiences as people who are Middle Eastern people, and specifically with eating disorders and body image and appearance ideals. I really appreciate you bringing that perspective into the conversation. What would need to change in order to create a society or, or like appearance ideals that are safe for people to experience? Or what uh, progress have you noticed that has made you hopeful? So just trying to like look to the future and orient the conversation towards that and like sort of calls to action maybe to, to people who are listening um, even if it's on the level of like individuals, how to how to speak to your friends, how to set boundaries with your friends, if you have experiences with that or calls to action to larger uh, players in, in mental health in general. Anything you have to say that's future oriented, I'd love to hear your perspective on what the next steps should look like. I think there are a few things that they're not huge things, but they can make a huge difference in people's lives. And so I think that they're worth saying due to that importance. Actually, just the other day, I was on, I think it was Instagram. And I guess, um, I don't know if this is a new line of, of garments that Rihanna has put out, but there is this picture and it was just like, blowing up but in the best possible way because I think in the the brand was Savage X and I think the um it was in like the men's like men's underwear line I think that she had but she had models of many different body types in, in that particular line and like the comments were just like people were so moved and so they were almost given permission to love their bodies because this really big star like Rihanna had included these models in the collection as kind of proof that oh these people are beautiful and people in the comments were saying things like oh well like now I can stop like feeling this dislike towards my body because I now see it as being beautiful and we're just so overcome with emotion and that's such a small thing, really, but it was so, I mean, I think because Rihanna is Brianna, I mean, she's pretty, pretty, pretty big star quality, you know, doing something like that has such a big effect. But I think in, uh, even in smaller scale situations, that can be the case. Another great clothing brand that I came across recently from Vancouver is Po de Lou. And they're also really terrific. Gabe's like freaking out in the best way right now. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, they have so many good, good clothes and just like it's it, the the brand is kind of. Um, Gabe, you can probably back me up on this. It's tailored um, towards creating collared shirts um, for like basically bodies that aren't male um, or like stereotypically male. So it's it's really just a, a fantastic brand. And a lot of like they have models like all different like backgrounds, body types. They have some models like from the disability community as well. And it's just amazing to see and just so validating, I think, to, to be able to see that. So that's another um, example. And then I think the last thing at least that comes to my mind, and this is more of just a day-to-day -day sort of thing that we have to unlearn, I think, is not immediately jumping to the conclusion that because somebody's body looks a certain way, that they're that they're feeling a certain way. So um, I think sometimes people assume that if others are at like a certain weight, that they're not that they're feeling a certain way, but really emotion is and mental health like it's not tied to a certain weight it's tied to like having support having 
the validation to be who you are. And like, I think as it, it's been said here many times, um, very, very uh, eloquently just of how like certain diagnoses are invalidated being at a certain weight or rather when, when people are at a certain weight and that's just like, it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be that way. So just like validating people's experiences as truth, regardless of the weight that they're at, the way they're expressing themselves, their gender identity, their sexual orientation, just like accept people's truth as truth. And that's that. You know, we're hanging out in this global pandemic and have been for like almost a year now. So I have been doing a lot more online shopping and have definitely noticed that like in a lot of mainstream brands, there's a lot more like diversity in terms of like body size of models and of race and culture like being represented. And so like, well, that's one of the things that I've really noticed shifting over the last year that I find really hopeful and hopefully like, you know, people will be able to look at the models and be like, oh yeah, I can see myself like wearing this outfit now instead of like seeing it only, you know, as something that's appropriate for like a size like negative zero, which is like an even ridiculous concept that it exists. That's like another one of my rants, the whole like you can be a zero or a double zero or like, you know, like whatever such thing, which is like just really like making women and like all kind of people feel like they can't even take up space, which is terrible. But the the thing that I think also we still need to work on is like how on, on social media people are kind of representing either body neutrality or like body positivity because like I think it should be more inclusive of a range of sizes um, like showing up in terms of body like positivity. Some of the people that I work with have said well like body positivity like only feels like it applies to like people of like certain sizes and like it should hopefully be a movement that like represents like a, a range of sizes because like we should be able to experience like body neutrality and bo body positivity like regardless of size like that's kind of what we're like trying to go for here when we are like thinking about like interacting with people or like even like giving comments like to people like we so often feel like a need to comment on people's appearance that I just don't think is like useful or helpful a lot of the time to very small children even like it's something that like can cause a lot of like focus on like size and weight and that kind of stuff like from the beginning and like a lot of like oh they're so cute or they're so beautiful or like um all of that stuff and if we can take like the focus off of those making those comments or like um giving that feedback and more like to bring it into the space of like what are you interested in and like what is your identity and who are you as a human um like in a way from the focus on appearance um, I think that that's such an important piece um, to help shift like this whole experience that people have to be more than just like a, a person in a body that's whatever size. I think, like I said, this conversation is hope because let's be honest, we didn't have this conversation back when we needed it the most. <laughs> so I definitely see a lot of progress happening, but we should be very mindful that that progress is not performative or marginalizing the folks and putting them on the side from the most marginalized, right? Something that Rafaela brought up, which I see a lot, is thin people taking up the body positivity space. And, uh, you know, that whole meme on TikTok with like bodies that look like this also look like this, that annoyed me so much because it was all thin people. And uh, that's what came up on the For You page the most instead of the, uh, the moment, uh, you know, you decenter the most marginalized, the, the, the whole movement is derailed. It doesn't matter anymore. Right. So and the same thing happens to me now at the, you know, old age apparently or uh, to model of 33 I am a model now and that was because I wanted a face like mine to represent people like me and so I'm trying to you know jam myself into the nook and crannies of the space being like hey I'm available but obviously I'm too old or I'm too something but 
what I see is that even though I'm included, I'm always like the person on the side or always the person who like doesn't have the right makeup artist. Or even if I see like, you know, dark skin representation or South Asian representation somewhere, it's like the most privileged people from that side, right? Like, there's no conversation about caste. There's no com- conversation about fat phobia. So it's like our responsibility when we make it into those spaces to open up those conversations at the very least. Like, I'm sure we don't have the power to change everything. So obviously as workers and obviously as people sometimes who don't have power, we probably don't have you know the power to make space for someone else or whatever, but it's at least our responsibility to open that conversation and ask the right questions. So I think like as we progress towards hope, it's very important for us to open up conversations and open question everything so every space I enter I ask them like hey why didn't you think of including a person like this I know an amazing person who uh, is you know uh, embodying this message that you that you want to convey why don't you approach them too and just opening up that conversations I think is uh, you know part of my responsibility as I enter these spaces and something that gives me hope um, and something that I wish someone had told me earlier is how you know, as a child, I perceived beauty as beyond body image and beyond appearances, but nobody seemed to think that way. And so I think even now that beauty is so beyond physical appearance and beauty is so beyond just like looking at somebody and just looking at their picture. Um, it is important to decenter physical and visual beauty and make it a more holistic concept about what are the person's values? What does this person do in real life? How do they talk to other people? You know, how are they kind? Are they, you know, uh, you know, uh, doing the things that resonate with you? And I'm so surprised that, you know, in our movement towards body neutrality and image neutrality, uh, we are forgetting that it's not just, you know, even when we talk about beauty neutrality, I feel like a lot of people then just decenter the oppression that fat people face. They'll be like, oh, we need to be body neutral. But if you have a system that is like, you know, you have shamed fat people for so long, if they want to take up space, we have to lift them up. We have to give them positivity to make them to make it neutral. You can't just leave it at that and be like, hey, now everything's neutral. Everything's all in good. So in when we move towards neutrality, it's important to see like who has been marginalized, who is still at the edges, who are we still not including? and lift them up. And the way that you lift them up is through positivity. So, you know, continuing to have that nuance in that conversation is very, very important. Words have a lot of power. So, you know, expressing ourselves through words and art, I think is really important. So um, my whole goal with, you know, you know, even being on Instagram, which I feel like is so visually centric, and sometimes that's so toxic. I make it a point to like talk about what I've gone through. Like, hey, this is not just like a body in a clothes, you know, in a clothing that you're supposed to buy or whatever. And I try to move away from that as much as possible and tell you what's the whole picture. Like, who has this person? You know, how did the person, this person, enter the space? How did they feel all their life? And if you, you know, if we can't go beyond that, if we can't go beyond this like one-dimensional view of people. I think we'll just keep, you know, reaching the same issue where we are like centering one thing or the other and just like moving the goalpost from one place to the other, but like it really doesn't do anything for anyone. So just opening it up to be a more holistic and well-rounded conversation, um, I think, uh, you know, is what we should move towards. I really, really agree with you on rounding the conversation through inclusivity and Unfortunately, since we're dealing with something that is medicalized, we have to deal with it even through the medical system. And currently the research is just white. It is white, it is cis, it is binary. And I think a lot of it has to do with the way in which we not only educate ourselves, the way it's about the way that the medical system is educated, like Melissa said, to actually make sure that this is taught in medical school, that you're not running into a doctor that's saying, well, you can't be X and Y at the same time when you're in your head, you're like, and I'm X and Y and here we are. Um, But also like going down into even further like the way that we treat the next generation and like when we come across like body negativity and like fat phobia and shaming to try to see even though it's really 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 hard 
when we do receive those messages that are really negative about whatever it is to if that person we see is actually younger to go from a place of love of like why do you feel that way not they're 12 so their insert ableist word and so i'm not going to educate them they can learn from them their cells they're 12 they said something offensive we can all think back to when we were 12 years old and cringe a lot and i think that that is part of teaching the next generation and not doing the whole like just google it like letting the, the people that need to take that space in the front I feel this conversation has been extremely like wonderful and changing. We are all limited by biases. We have to put in to understand and admit the fact that we have biases to then understand who our biases are keeping people out and then include them in research so that we're then less likely to be discriminated in the medical system because then the data will be there and because the facts I'm doing question, I'm doing air quotes and facts is because the quote, quote unquote facts that are made are based on cis white, like are based on basically the wasp characteristics. And that's why there's so many problems in medicine and in treating people and in treating quality of life. Like if we actually turned it around, like we could get it where we talk to our doctors and the first thing that they ask us when you're like, my foot hurts. The first thing somebody hasn't asked is, well, can you lose 30 pounds before you get an x-ray? Having that no longer be a thing for my children. Like that's what makes me hopeful is because I will raise my children in a way that I was not raised. And because I have learned from this and because I have worked on this, like I think about those kids or like my children's and like the children that will be around me, the children in my community, I think about how they will grow up. It just makes me smile. Because even as bad as we think that things are in the world right now, like every person is is trying in here is just trying to make it better for the next group of us that are just trying to just go through this life and just like rock and roll, basically. End of that. Just, Gabe, when you were speaking, I was reminded of this amazing post that I saw and I wanted to share it with everyone because I think it's so relevant to this conversation. And the raising of kids to love their bodies, what regardless of what size their bodies are. So the post that I saw, it was just a screenshot of, it was, I think, a parent who took their 12-year-olds to the store and they, they were trying on a pair of pants and they couldn't fit into the pants. And their immediate reaction was my thighs and butt are too powerful for these pants and I was like yes like this is what I hope to see for the next generation as well not a negative statement but like I'm too badass and I'm too powerful for these like for these small sizes like you cannot contain me so that's that's what I like seeing those things really makes me hopeful as well when talking about hope like that's a hard one because sometimes I feel very hopeless <laughs> with you know my, my mental illnesses and you know general fat phobia but the shift I'm seeing on social media brings me a bit of hope you know to see marginalized bodies being in like front and center like that gives me hope and I just hope that we can all like unfollow people that do not make us feel good about ourselves. We can stop giving them all the power, take back that power for ourselves and content that we value so that we can just be rid of everything that makes us feel bad. And I'm so grateful for all of you here. This has been such a beautiful conversation as sometimes I feel very isolated in these thoughts and feelings. So just knowing that there's other beautiful, beautiful people here that you know can resonate it means the whole world and now i have new friends which i'm so excited about <laughs> i will try to put a cap on what this experience has been but it's like difficult to, to put that into words eh this was very very special and so important and i think um i like rafella struggle to feel hopeful um i like seema feel the responsibility to just encourage being critical. 
But I think that this conversation in itself is so revolutionary. We have spoken about things together in a way that I don't think has been done before. I've been in this space for quite a while and I've never heard um, South Asian representation from a lower caste speaking to somebody with a disability, speaking to uh, non-binary folks, speaking to people who experience fat phobia, speaking to men who experience disordered eating. It's just, it's a really important conversation. And I'm so grateful to all of you for being here. And um, it's conversations like this that give us reason to be hopeful. There is a lot of change that, that gives us reason to be hopeful too. There is better representation now. Doctors are being forced to understand the role they play in individual people's mental health in general, which is always great. Um, researchers are thinking about how to bring in people who have been left out of these conversations. But I hope everybody who watches this too and anybody who interacts with this content will feel a bit of a personal responsibility to leverage whatever privilege they have in order to bring somebody who does not have that privilege to the table. Because we we all have something we can use to, to extend an arm and lift somebody else up. And we need to feel personally responsible for this shift. I think that's something that's really important. Um, it is it is a systems level thing too. It's not, again, the onus can't be on us to cause this massive change, but at every opportunity it's possible. Um, we, we can make a real big difference by keeping this front and center. So I just wanna thank you all so, so much. This was, uh, yeah, I'm gonna have a ton to think about for many, many days. <laughs> <laughs>